Hello everyone, Gabby here from bootcamp.com and for today's video we'll be talking about the structures of the external ear. So before we get into all the structures of the external ear, I want us to be familiar with the three parts of the ear. So if we start laterally and work our way medially, you're going to see two structures that are sitting along the lateral sides of your head and that structure is considered the auricle. So the auricle is the first structure that's going to go ahead and make up the external ear. The auricle is going to be responsible for funneling those sound waves from the external environment environment into the external acoustic meatus or the external auditory meatus. So the auricle and the external acoustic meatus are both portions of the external ear. And then eventually as we reach the tympanic membrane, so this is the eardrum. So the tympanic membrane is what is going to separate the external ear and the middle ear. So on the lateral sides of the tympanic membrane, we have the external ear and on the medial sides of the tympanic membrane, we have the middle ear. Now, as those sound waves are traveling in the external acoustic meatus, it's going to cause the tympanic membrane to start vibrating. And within the middle ear, we have these auditory ossicles. So these very small bones that come into contact with each other and also come in contact with this tympanic membrane. So when that tympanic membrane vibrates, the auditory ossicles are going to go ahead and transmit that mechanical information they're receiving from the tympanic membrane and transmit it into the aspects of the inner ear. So within the inner ear is where we're going to find the cochlear apparatus as well as the vestibular apparatus. And both of these structures contain very important nerves that are really responsible for transmitting those electrical signals to the brain to allow us to process hearing and also super important for balance. So now let's focus specifically on the external ear. So we're first going to start talking about the auricle. And as I said, the auricle is the structures that are sitting on the lateral sides of the head that we can actually see here. And the auricle consists of cartilage. So you can see how flexible the auricle is because it's made up of an elastic cartilage. And the elastic cartilage along with the elevation and the depression, so you can see here how we have some elevations, we also have some depressions along these areas here that will allow for the transmission of sound and amplify the sound waves and funnel them in to the areas of the external acoustic meatus. The first elevation we're going to talk about here is the helix and you can see that the helix is along the outer rims and forms the outer edges along the more posterior aspects of the auricle and the helix is going to be continuous with the fleshy lobule that we're seeing along the more inferior aspects of the ear. So all those earrings or wherever you get your ear pierced, you're getting your lobule pierced. And specifically at the area of the lobule, the lobule is the only structure of the auricle that is actually not made up of cartilage. Instead, it's just made up of a loose areolar connective tissue and some adipose tissue as well. We can also see another elevation here that is found anterior to the helix called the antihelix. And if we look more anteriorly to the antihelix, we're going to be able to see this depression or this hollow space. And this hollow space is referred to as the concha. And the concha is primarily responsible for capturing and funneling those sound waves into the external acoustic meatus over here. We then see more anteriorly along the aspects of the ear, we can see another elevation here called the tragus. And then we can also see opposing the tragus, we can see another elevation here called the antitragus. So essentially the main function of the auricle and all these different structures, these elevations and depressions is to really funnel the sound waves into the external acoustic meatus. Next, we'll talk about the sensory regions of the auricle. So we do know that we have some nerves that will go and supply sensory innervation to the areas of the auricle. And we'll start off first with the nerve that supplies more anteriorly, so along the aspects of the tragus, and more superiorly along the aspects of the ear. The innervation there is going to be done by the auriculotemporal nerve. The auriculotemporal nerve is a branch off of the mandibular branch of our trigeminal nerve. So the mandibular branch is going to be found in the infratemporal fossa. The auriculotemporal comes directly off of that nerve in a posterior direction and starts to swoop upwards and starts to ascend along the anterior aspects of the ear and along the areas of the temples with that superficial temporal artery. It will then go off to give off sensory branches to go and innervate these areas of the auricle. Next, we have the lesser occipital nerve that we'll be supplying here in green, so more of the posterior aspects of the auricle. And the lesser occipital nerve is going to originate from the cervical plexus. So the cervical plexus, so it contains nerve roots from C2. And the lesser occipital nerve, as you can see here in green, will emerge from the cervical plexus and emerge posteriorly along the SCM, or the sternocleidomastoid, where it will ascend to give off different branches to supply the posterior aspects of the ear and also to supply the mastoid region as well. 
Next, innervating the lobule or the more inferior aspects of the ear is where we're going to find the great auricular nerve. And the great auricular nerve, similar to the lesser occipital nerve, is also originating from that cervical plexus, but also has nerve roots C2 and C3. And you can see here the great auricular nerve in purple, same thing, going to come off that cervical plexus. It's going to pass posteriorly along that SCM and ascend as it will give off branches to go and supply that lobule. Next, if we look along the areas of the concha here, you'll see this area in pink is going to be innervated by the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, so our cranial nerve number 10. And the vagus nerve will travel through the tympanic cavity where it will give off some sensory branches to supply the concha and certain aspects of the external acoustic meatus. We can also see some supply from the facial nerve. The facial nerve does travel within the ear as well, within the facial canal. And as it travels within the facial canal, it does give off some sensory branches that will also go and supply the concha as well as the external acoustic meatus. So you can see here, I've added some orange stars here to represent that the innervation of that facial nerve is found sporadically along those areas of the concha. So we're seeing a mix there between the innervation from the auricular branch of the vagus nerve and the sensory branches from the facial nerve. But the facial nerve, as it travels through the ear and eventually exits through the stylomastoid frame in here, its main responsibility or function will be to go to provide motor innervation here to the muscles of facial expression. Next, let's talk about the blood supply to the oracle and all the blood vessels that go and supply the oracle are all going to be direct branches off of our external carotid artery. So if we have a look here, the first branch we're going to talk about here is the posterior auricular. So just to orient you right over here, we can see the external carotid giving off its different branches as it's ascending through the areas of the head and the neck. And the external carotid will go ahead and give off this posterior auricular artery that I've outlined in green. And as the name implies, this artery is going to travel posteriorly along the aspects of the ear or along the aspects of the auricle. So it's going to go ahead and do that along the posterior regions and go and supply the more posterior aspects of the auricle. It's also going to give off branches to go and supply part of the scalp that is found along the areas of the ear. Next, we have our occipital artery that I've outlined here in orange. Now, the occipital artery doesn't supply as much as the posterior auricular artery would, but nonetheless, there may be a few small branches as it enters the occipital region where it will then give off to supply the more posterior aspects of the ear and along the areas of the mastoid process. And then lastly, we have our superficial temporal artery. So the external carotid is going to continue to ascend here. And the superficial temporal artery is going to be the terminal branch or one of the terminal branches of our external carotid. So again, we can see our external carotid here. We can see it terminating into our maxillary artery over here and our superficial temporal artery that I've outlined here in yellow. So the superficial temporal artery will give off branches that will go ahead and supply the more anterior and superior aspects of the auricle. Next, let's move on and talk about the external acoustic meatus. So I mentioned here that we have the auricle, so the first part of the external ear, and then we also have within the auricle, we have the concha that goes and feeds or transmits those sound waves into the external acoustic meatus. So this whole area here is considered the external acoustic meatus, which will end at the level of the tympanic membrane. Now, the external acoustic meatus can be divided into two separate regions. The first is the outer third, and that outer third is mostly going to be composed of the auricular cartilage that we found along the aspects of the auricle along with some adipose tissue or some fat tissue. And within the tissue that actually lines that outer third is going to contain the ceruminous glands. And ceruminous glands are modified apocrine sweat glands that are mixed with sebaceous glands that are responsible for producing our earwax. And the earwax is extremely important for trapping bacteria and protecting the ear canal. As we move more inwards into the external acoustic meatus is where we're going to find the inner two-thirds. And the inner two-thirds are really housed within the temporal bone. And then eventually that's when we get to the tympanic membrane where we have the ending of the external ear. Now, an important thing to note about the external acoustic meatus is it's like a tunnel, and this tunnel doesn't necessarily follow a straight direction more medially. It actually takes some slight turns. It's going to pass upward in an anterior direction, and then it's going to take a turn to start traveling a little bit more posteriorly, and then eventually takes a slight turn again to travel anteriorly, and then will eventually descend slightly, and then that's where we get to start seeing that tympanic membrane. So just keep in mind that the external acoustic meatus does not travel this straight direction. 
So that's why if you go to examine the external acoustic meatus, a physician will often pull the ear superiorly, posteriorly, and laterally in order to better visualize the external auditory meatus. Next, we're going to talk about the innervation of the external acoustic meatus, and we can see here that I have two separate colors. So the innervation of the external acoustic meatus is fairly similar to the oracle. So first, along the more superior aspects of the external acoustic meatus in blue, I've outlined here that the innervation of this area is also going to be done by that auriculotemporal nerve. So we can see this auriculotemporal nerve here again. So we've taken a little snippet along the lateral sides of the head. And if we zoomed in here, we can see the auriculotemporal nerve as it ascends along the areas of the temples. It will give off some small branches that will go in and supply the external acoustic meatus as well as the auricle. We'll then see in pink that the majority of the innervation of the meatus is done by the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. And we can see the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, a very, very small branch that you can see right over here along the posterior aspects of this external acoustic meatus. We will also see some innervation again from the facial nerve as it travels through the facial canal or through the aspects of the ear. And we can better see that facial nerve here in this image. It has been slightly cut, but we can see that facial nerve alongside that auricular branch of the vagus nerve. So let's finish off talking about the features and the quadrants of the tympanic membrane. So as I said, the external ear is going to end at the level of the tympanic membrane. Now, the tympanic membrane is very important structure that vibrates and is responsible for producing mechanical sounds or mechanical sound waves to the areas of the auditory ossicles. Now, some important features of the tympanic membrane. So right here on the right is an actual view of a normal tympanic membrane. So we've taken the otoscope and we're viewing inside the external acoustic meatus all the way up to the eardrum or to that tympanic membrane. Now, an important thing to note is that the tympanic membrane can be divided into four different quadrants. And these quadrants essentially essentially help during clinical scenarios where we may have, let's say, perforation of a specific aspect of the tympanic membrane. It allows us to divide the tympanic membrane and really get precisely the areas that we're you know, talking about or the areas that are injured. So that being said, we have the four quadrants and they're basically named on their locations. So we first have the anterior and superior quadrant. We then have the posterior superior quadrant. So those are all going to be found on the superior aspects, either anteriorly or posteriorly. And then as we move more inferiorly, we're going to have the anterior inferior quadrant, and then we're going to have the posterior inferior quadrant. So we mentioned that the tympanic membrane is going to come into contact with the auditory ossicles. Specifically, the tympanic membrane is going to be coming into contact with the malleus. And we can actually see components of the malleus as it's actually hooking on to that tympanic membrane. So for example, within this area over here and right over here, we can see the lateral process of the malleus. We then see the handle of the malleus as it starts to descend. So right over here and over here as well. And then we can see more inferiorly right along the middle. Here is where we're going to find the umbo. So this is going to be the umbo of the malleus. Now the tympanic membrane can also be split into these different regions. So we have the pars flaccida, which is this area over here. And the pars flaccida, is essentially the flaccid part of the tympanic membrane. So it's less taut compared to the pars densa that really makes up the majority here of that tympanic membrane. Now the pars flaccida is going to be less taut and less tight. It's going to be slightly thinner as well. It's going to allow for some minor movements and adjustments of the tympanic membrane and is also gonna provide some flexibility to the overall structure. Versus the pars densa is going to be a lot more dense, it's going to be a lot thicker, and it's essential for the effective sound Sound wave transmission to the auditory ossicles. It can also act as a barrier, preventing any particles or bacteria from entering into aspects of the middle ear. Now, separating that pars tensa and that pars flaccida, we have a posterior malleolar fold along the posterior aspect, and then we also have an anterior malleolar fold along the anterior aspect. The last structure I want to mention here along the tympanic membrane is going to be the cone of light. And the cone of light is normally found along the anterior inferior quadrant of that tympanic membrane. The cone of light is really only there due to the bright light from the otoscope as the physician is examining the ear. But this cone of light also allows us to better visualize the handle and the structures of the malleus that go and attach onto that tympanic membrane. Now, as far as sensory innervation to the tympanic membrane, it follows generally the same suit as the external acoustic meatus. 
So along the more anterior aspects of the tympanic membrane, we're going to receive innervation from the auricular temporal nerve. And then as we move more posteriorly along the tympanic membrane, more superiorly here is going to be innervated by the sensory branches of the facial nerve, and more inferiorly here will be innervated by the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. So this is considered the lateral surface of the tympanic membrane, right? The lateral surface of the tympanic membrane is facing the external ear, versus the medial surface, so on the other side of the tympanic membrane, is going to be facing the middle ear. So in this case, that side of the tympanic membrane is going to be innervated by a branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve or a cranial nerve number nine. All right, so let's see what we've learned today. So label the features of the oracle and then come on back when you're ready. Okay, so we're talking here about our elevations and depressions. So along the more outer surfaces of the external ear here, along the oracle, we're gonna find the helix. Anterior to the helix, we have another elevation called the antihelix. We can then see anterior to that, we see a depression called the concha. So the concha is what's going to be responsible for feeding those sound waves into the external acoustic meatus. We can then see a couple other elevations here. So anteriorly, we have the tragus. And then if we move slightly more posteriorly, we're going to find the antitragus. And then lastly, we have the lobule. So the lobule is the only portion of the oracle that does not contain cartilage. It's really only made up of loose connective tissue or this areolar adipose tissue. So all in all, all of these structures in the oracle are really responsible for feeding those sound waves into the external acoustic meatus and amplifying those sounds. Next, which nerves are responsible for providing sensory innervation to the external ear? So pause the video, come on back when you're ready. So remember that all aspects of the external ear are receiving the same innervation from these nerves. So if we have a look at the blue areas, the blue area is going to be innervated by the auricular temporal nerve, which is a branch off of our mandibular branch of our trigeminal. We can then see here in green, so along the areas of the auricles, we're going to see the lesser occipital nerve, and in purple, we're then going to see the great auricular nerve. Both nerves are going to be originating from the cervical plexus, from nerve root C2 for lesser occipital, or nerve root C2, C3 for great auricular. Next in pink, we have the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, and then we're going to see some slight innervation there from the sensory branches of the facial nerve as that facial nerve travels within the ear. All right, our last two questions here. So label the features of the tympanic membrane, and then a patient sustains a head injury in a car accident, resulting in damage to the mastoid process which artery is most likely to be affected, leading to compromised blood supply to the external ear. So pause the video, come on back when you're ready. So for question number three, the features of the tympanic membrane, we said that we can divide the tympanic membrane into a pars flaccida, and we can also compare it to the pars densa along this area here. We then see a posterior and anterior malleolar fold that helps actually separate or distinct between the compartments of the pars flaccida and the pars tensa. We can then see the structures of the malleus, right? The malleus that hooks onto that tympanic membrane. So we can see the lateral process of the malleus more superiorly. As it descends, we see the handle, and then more inferiorly is where we're going to find the umbo. And then lastly, we can see in the anterior inferior quadrant, we can see the cone of light that is given by the otoscope as we're actually examining the external ear. And then for question number four, we said damage to the mastoid process. So which artery is responsible for supplying the mastoid process? It is mostly going to be done by the posterior auricular. There may be some small, small branches that go from the occipital artery, but nonetheless, the majority of the supply to the mastoid process is done by that posterior auricular artery. Here are the references for the images that I used today, and I hope you enjoyed today's lesson on the external ear. Please let us know if you have any questions.